Yes, folks. Welcome back. Left Reckoning with another Sunday show. Uh, good to be with you, David, on this wonderful afternoon. Yeah, man. I'm happy to be doing it. These uh, these theory readings are always very rewarding. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to do these. And I don't know, hoping to do these more regularly. And this one's going to be a three-parter um, because we picked a pretty big text, I got to say, Matt. I, I hope it was uh, fun and rewarding for you. I realized after I decided, I uh, texted you that we should do this one, it's like, Oh, I sort of sent a big one for us to, <laughs> to cover. You know, it's it's big for like one episode, but I will. I do don't want to give people the wrong impression. It's only yeah. three hours on Audible, um, and all of the stuff is. And this is this is uh, like I was telling David a gap in my literacy. I, uh, I'd never read Rosa before, um, but like all the stuff on credit and co ops and different things that are, are frankly relevant. Um, but it's very it's it's direct. Um, uh, three hours, uh, and you can be done with this. Uh, yeah. So, like, it, it's longer than we can handle and digest in one episode. But it is not. It's not like you know, Piketty or something. Like and, that. and she, she also is like, I think, extremely readable um, for mm-hmm. people in 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 like her class of, of theorists. Like, you know, Marx is oftentimes talked about as being like difficult to to read. And like, I understand that to a certain extent. I also think that like, oftentimes. Um, that can be a little bit overblown. I mean, he's, he's a very fun and funny writer. Lenin is yes. somebody who is like absolutely burning with fire every time he writes. Um, so sometimes like there's some older language and stuff like that in there, but you know, he's got good quips and jokes and roasting people who you don't know who they are. And it's funny enough on its own, but Rosa, I find to be like a very clear thinker and, and, and writer. And I, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, we have a, uh, well, you go ahead. No, I mean, actually, uh, we have, we have, yeah, we have this it, biography, um, thing and I mean, I have, I have more to say on this, but I just want to say before we get into like the biography of, of Rosa, you know, one thing that one reason I think that she's such an interesting thinker is she is claimed by so many different people, right? Um, you know, there's people in the democratic socialist tradition who claim her Leo Panitch, for example, um, because of her criticisms of um, some of the excesses of, of Bolshevism. You know, this is somebody who, you know, was uh, was a comrade and a friend of, of these movements. Don't get it. Don't misunderstand it. But had very, very significant uh, criticisms of like Lenin. Um, this is somebody who is oftentimes, you know, held um, close by a lot of the revolutionary communists. And you can understand why she was a revolutionary communist and was killed um, uh, for that. Um, but she also like, you know, again, like had some very serious disagreements with like vanguardism as a, as a political strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, because of her, her like socialist feminism, um, it's also, I think claimed by a lot of people who might not even consider themselves quote unquote, like Marxists, um, more kind of, you know, socialist, if you want to use that kind of term. Socialist. Yeah. I mean, you know, depending on um, the season. <laughs> folks out there, but I mean, there's no doubt about it too, that, you know, she was a woman writing at a time where it was really difficult, um, to be a, a woman, um, just in society in general, let alone in like radical national politics, international politics, like she was. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll play this biography for people who don't know anything about her to give people, um, a sense of her, but I just find her, you know, she really is like a Titan of not just socialist Marxist history, but I think like history in general, just like a really towering figure. Yeah, uh, this is a uh, uh, sort of 20 minute video put together by the Rose, uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. I'm not sure what the translation for Stiftung is, but uh, uh, great little video put together by uh, Eleanor Penny. And this is a section um, relevant to uh, what we'll be talking about today. Permanentes Lernen braucht. Around the turn of the century, as the SPD were beginning to make gains in Parliament, some prominent leaders like Edward Bernstein started to distance themselves from the militancy of some of the membership. They pushed for gradual wins and cooperation with capital instead of revolution. Rosa Luxemburg took them to task for this approach, sparking the now famous Bernstein debate. She argued that whilst reforms are important, abandoning revolutionary goals altogether means propping up a system fundamentally geared towards the destruction of life. The Bernstein debate was very important because with this debate she became famous in the German Social Democratic Party. The Bernstein debate was the starting point of developing step by step later a new type of left politics 
from below, from the social movements, from um, self-organization, from a new understanding. You see Lenin, Kautsky and all the other thought we should bring the right uh, consciousness into the masses. She had a totally different view. The masses by their own practice will develop and we should help them to develop their own consciousness. She believed that real liberation and real socialism had to be grounded in the kind of self-enlightenment and self-education and class consciousness that came from ordinary working people engaging directly in struggle. Socialism couldn't come from the top. Socialism had to come from the kind of power that remains with the masses. This kind of thinking is grounded in the staunch conviction that socialism and democracy are fundamentally interconnected and fundamentally inseparable. Socialism without democracy is just tyranny by another name. And democracy without socialism is just a kind of sham, hollow liberation for a tiny privileged minority. Peter Hudis is one of the leading experts on Rosa Luxemburg's life and work. We live in a time where the language of freedom is so often captured by the right and especially the neoliberal right. So in contrast to that, what did freedom mean for Rosa Luxemburg and the socialists around her? Luxemburg was a firm a supporter and advocate of democracy, including liberal democracy. Um, she argued that a liberal democratic, what we might call a democratic republic, is the best form in which to carry out the class struggle. Because if workers cannot organize openly, if they cannot form trade unions, if they cannot fight for improvements in their everyday conditions, if they're subjected to dictatorial or authoritarian conditions in which this kind of political mobilization is not possible, it's going to make it much harder to agitate against the system. We can uh, pull up there. We'll put the rest of that in the link or in the comments for folks who want to uh, watch the rest of it there. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think down the line, I, I think this probably won't, when we're going to do this as a three-part series, um, and two, I also don't think this will be the last Rosa theory reading that we do, um, and three, I think that we should probably just do um, an episode sometime maybe with a guest on like the history and the biography of, of Rosa, because um, she really did live um, a very consequential life, um, you know, grew up in Poland, you know, time of, of pogroms and, you know, abuse comes over to Germany, um, where she ends up becoming, you know, a Milton and a member of the SPD, the, the, the Social Democratic Party in Germany. And, you know, again, we always have to remind folks of this, that like the terminology, when you hear social Democrats today, like it's in the context of these debates that like both like Lenin in Russia and um, in, in some sense in, in, in Germany, you had this kind of struggle um, sort of come out after um, some of these betrayals of, of the social democrats. So everyone was calling themselves social democratic at that point. So I just think it's important not to import um, some of the distinctions up front between like a communist and a social democrat when you read some of these historical texts, because those were like the terminology mm. that they were using at the time. And they started using communist and things like that as a way to differentiate themselves from the social democrats later after these splits started to happen. Um, you know, she's murdered by the state um, for for joining a um, revolutionary action. I think it's really interesting about Rosa too is that um, when there was this push to basically do like armed revolution in Germany, she thought that it wasn't right. It wasn't the right time. They weren't prepared to do it. But she was also, you know, such a comrade uh, that she stood with people once once they did. You know, um, so mm -hmm. somebody who. Uh, I think is you know has a, has a lot of uh, heart and commitment uh, to these to these fights. Um, I'm trying to think again. Like we could we could just go through her biography um, again in like a whole episode. So I think you know if you want to learn more about her, there's plenty of resources. I think watching that 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 video that that we have is is a great place to start. Um, but I think it's worth investigating this text um, and sort of treating this text on its own, at least to, uh, you know, as a good introduction to her before we sort of focus in the future on, you know, her life and some of those lessons. Yeah, totally. So, you know, in the ways of introduction, um, she's responding to um, Edward Bernstein, um, who, as that video was sort of saying, is you know, arguing that because of reforms within capitalism that like the collapse um, and the crisis that is sort of 
inherent in like Marxism and socialist theory isn't going to happen. And that like, you know, the job of socialists is basically to play the role as like the most adamant reformist that basically, and we'll get into this in the text, that eventually like all these reforms will basically reach a tipping point um, where we just sort of wake up one day in, in, in socialism, um, which is something that, uh, you know, uh, you know, Lenin certainly disagrees with, as did Rosa. And this text is very much in response um, to some of these ideas. And, you know, while she's responding to a very particular historic con context and debate here, these, you know, end up being very, uh, you know, universal in the sense that these are arguments that we still hear today. These are questions that we still um, fight about on the on the left and the socialist movement today. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if these things uh, weren't timeless in a sense, but they become timeless because we sort of haven't escaped the conditions that make this debate um, really necessary. Yeah, I mean, we're still, and it feels somewhat new. I mean, we'll don't want to um, uh, spoil it too much, but like the credit conversation and the we talk about the adaptability of capitalism um, is, is relevant to our current like credit card age, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, particularly. Um, it's 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 wild. So let's uh, let's jump into the text, Matt. Um, so we're doing the first few sections from Reform or Revolution, and uh, we'll put a link. You can get all this on Marxist.org. Um, I know there's uh, audio versions that maybe you can direct people to, Matt, as well. Um, but, uh, you know, you can get this for free. As yeah, there's many. free ones on YouTube as well, um, yeah. uh, uh, readings. Um, but, yeah, let's jump into this text, and we'll open up. We're going to skip the introduction and go right into part one, chapter one, the opportunist method. And I'll just read this first section here, and uh, we can sort of build off of that. If it is true that theories are only the images of the phenomena of the exterior world in the human consciousness, it must be added, added concerning Eddard Bernstein's system that theories are sometimes inverted images. Think of a theory, theory of instituting socialism by means of social reform in the face of complete stagnation of the reform movement in Germany. Think of a theory of trade union control. Consider the theory of winning a majority in parliament after the revision of the constitution of Saxony and in the view of the most recent attempts against universal suffrage. However, the pivotal point of Bernstein's system is not located in his conception of the practical tasks of social democracy. It is found in his stand on the course of the objective development of capitalist society, which in turn is closely bound to his conception of the practical tasks of social democracy. So, you know, we're starting to get the, the, the stakes here where, you know, there, there's two fights that are happening. There's the, the fight about what the party and the movement should be doing in the here and now, um, which, you know, is debatable. Um, and what makes this like a universal text instead of a particular one, Bernstein's thing is not just that he has certain kind of platforms or ideas of what the social democratic movement should be doing in Germany at that time, but rather that what the, the reasoning where his ideas are coming from is in a way an aversion or, or, or a rejection of some of the fundamental ideas of, of socialist thought and socialist theory. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe you know specifically more, but it seems like, and, and she, I think she gets into this later in the book that um, Marxism is just sort of one uh, thing that um, Bernstein likes to appeal to. But he's like sort of um, presents himself as more open to all sorts of philosophies. But ultimately, um, when you ignore that one, that you end up basically like um, uh, subscribing to a bunch of bourgeois sorts of reformist uh, ideas. Totally. And like, um, she has, um, she has this, you know, argument with him, um, about the way that he, so, I mean, we'll get a clear understanding of what Bernstein is, is arguing as we go through his text. Cause she sets it up, I think rather well. Um, but effectively like he's looking at capitalism in, in Germany in the early 1900s and saying, there's been these shifts. There's been reforms. Some of these things that we thought that the capitalists would never do, they're doing, which shows that we're actually starting to see socialism sort of being created in society. It's so reformism, right? This is like the classic reformist arguments that, you know, a more regulated capitalism is going to create um, these, these conditions that will sort of undo capitalism 
um, not just from the ballot box, but like in the th- through like the legal system that will fundamentally shift and change the nature of you know the capitalist economy, um, which Rosa finds to be absolutely uh, ludicrous. And uh, you know, as we'll get into it, some of the fundamental arguments of uh, Bernstein's uh, understanding of capitalism are, are quite uh, flawed. Um, but let's get to this. Uh, if you go down, when we go down a little bit, she sort of introduces Bernstein a bit in this first chapter. Um, and uh, she goes here, she goes, um, what Bernstein questions is not the rap- rapidity of the development of capitalist society, but the march of the development itself, and consequently the very possibility of a change to socialism. Socialist theory up to now declared that the point of departure for transformation to socialism would be a general and catastrophic crisis. We must distinguish in this outlook two things, the fundamental idea and its exterior form. The fundamental idea consists of the affirmation that capitalism, as a result of its own inner contradictions, moves toward a point where it will become unbalanced, when it, simply, when it will simply become impossible. There were good reasons for conceiving that juncture in the form of a catastrophic general commercial crisis, but that is of a secondary importance when the fundamental idea is considered. The scientific basis of socialism rests, as is well known, on the three principal results of capitalist development. First, on the growing anarchy of the capitalist economy, leading inevitably to its ruin. Second, on the progressive socialization of the process of production, which creates the germs of the future, which, um, of the future social order. And third, on the increased organization and consciousness of the proletarian class, which constitutes the active factor in the coming revolution. Bernstein pulls away from the first of the three fundamental supports of scientific socialism. He says that capitalist development does not lead to general economic collapse. And let's unpack that a little bit, because I think that this is where um, some of Bernstein's ideas can seem almost relevant today, right? Because, you know, at at that point, capitalism was a relatively youngish system historically, Um, certainly much younger than it is today. Um, It wasn't as developed as it is today. Um, And we are still living under that system. So this is one of the kind of claims against Marxism that, you know, critics make is that, well, you were predicting collapse, um, a kind of world historic collapse of, of the system, and it didn't happen capitalism ended up being much, much more dynamic. And we'll get into some of the, um, the kind of economics arguments um, in, in a bit that Rosa makes even at that time showing that that, that um, the Bernstein kind of critique was wrongheaded. Um, but I think it's a very fair challenge to make in 2023, right? Um, that where's the collapse? Um, mm-hmm. In fairness, uh, we see Great Depression. <laughs> we come out yeah. of a depression. I mean, that's the thing is like, um, the, the idea that the collapse, um, particularly in the, the general commercial sense, like we've had a few of those, uh, we've lived yeah. through ones like you just mentioned, but also like the maintenance of it. it um, it, it, we do have this theory that I think is mistaken that capitalism just won out through like the power of ideas when we all know like the history of imperialism and that sort of thing um, um, also helped uh, and, and like mass murdering of communist parties, say in uh, okay. Indonesia or whatever, like and, those things I think also speak to where um, it wasn't foolish to think that the contradictions would ultimately, and still to this day, I mean, you had climate change, like, mm. the, like these sorts of things still exist, even if they haven't happened. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, and also like, it, it's not surprising to you that Rosa was also a, you know, a, a, a huge theory theorist of imperialism because she saw the kind of, um, reality of particularly Western Europe and Western and, and European capitalism as being very dependent on imperialism for sort of pushing down these contradictions. But again, we'll get into that in the next chapter where it's a little bit more technical. Um, but I wanted to look at these like three principles again and just put this in, in, in clear terms for us. The first is the anarchic system leads to its collapse. And, you know, think about modern capitalism, for example, mm-hmm. um, competition has not led to like greater coordination, um, but instead internal cannibalization of already existing production. And what I mean by that is that if you think about 
where we are today versus where we are we were a hundred years ago, capitalism has like truly, in its full sense, become a global system. Right, the world is incorporated in the capitalist market. Now it's uneven development. Right, there are capitalist economies that are much more advanced um, than others, um, but you know they're all sort of incorporated in in the world market. And you know, like a pro capitalist would say, well, this is great. Right, we have you know much more productive capacity. We should be you know producing more and better things. But if you actually look at what happens under capitalism, it's not so much. Um, a system that you know takes un- unproductive things and turns them productive. Um, in fact, it oftentimes attacks its own productivity in order to create it elsewhere. So what I mean by that is like you have companies that are fighting each other for the same kind of market share, and they have to destroy the other one to be able to be successful. And you see this particularly in developing um, economies where first you have um, international capital, basically everything has to be imported from you know, the quote unquote imperial core, um, high tech goods and things like that, then you get some kind of local industry. Um, but even once you have local industry, the local industry doesn't just sort of prop itself up and then continue to coordinate and expand and get better. It fights itself. It destroys itself. It creates its own crises. So it's this anarchic system of who is controlling production, who is controlling our capacities for these things. And it's not a rational system in the sense of here's social need, let's meet social need. It's what are the market demands? And when we get into credit, that relationship can be very, very obscured. You know, the libertarians out there, their argument about capitalism is that the market creates a perfect price for things. And um, therefore, it's like the best social system. But if you look at what happens under the market, it's not something that is inherently related um, to social need. That's why one of the fundamental crises of, of capitalism is something called overproduction. And just to put some meat on that term, I think a decent way to understand that is that like, let's say you have a business t- selling t-shirts, right? What would be ideal for you as somebody who produces t-shirts is for there to be an endless market for t-shirts. So the ability for you to make more and more money is just a question of your productive capacity to be able to make more and more t-shirts. The problem is, is that um, in reality versus the kind of perfect world, um, that demand is always going to be changing. And you can get to a point where there are too many things. And what happens when there's too many things? The price falls. So you're producing too much, um, which means that now there is a surplus of of that good out there. So it's not just one time the price goes down, it's a kind of precipitous fall. And overproduction becomes one of the main um, crises of, of, of capitalism historically. This is why like the kind of theory of imperialism is that like when your market is saturated, you have to go and attack another um, market. But the problem really becomes when it's a global system, you have multiple imperial powers, you have domestic markets, you have like continental markets and all this thing. All these capitalists trying to produce a similar kind of good are trying to destroy one another um, so that they can be the, the kind of last one standing. And this creates an anarchic system that creates a lot of waste. Um, it creates crisis by its very being. Um and, you know, the hope of socialism is that we can sort of break out of anarchic production. Um, you know, unlike some people who think that we need to eradicate productive capacities, which would be disastrous, um, socialists say that we should be able to use productive capacities for meeting social goods and, and needs instead of this anarchic war system that we have that creates crisis um, at home and abroad. Um, and it doesn't even utilize our productive capacities and resources in the best and most rational way. The second um, is that um, the socialization of production leads to this potential of a new order, right? Which is what we consider to be communism. So you have all of this production that at one point is sort of being done um, anarchically or at the home. You know, a lot of things are done in the home, um, making clothing, food, whatever. Um, And, you know, it's purely individual or like small, small organized thing. Um, Capitalism is revolutionary in the sense, progressive in the sense, this is the Marxist conception of it, because it actually socializes production. Um, And by socializing production, it incorporates us all into a kind of communal system. um, And um, it uh, 
um, it increases our capacity to create so that the amount of labor that goes into producing these things is, is lessened tremendously. And that gives us the potential of more free time of not being sort of, um, of being more insulated from, you know, natural disasters or different kind of crises that this socialization of production has a kind of progressive bent to it. Um, in the sense that, you know, we are maybe creating the, um, the system of the future. And the third one is that, um, Capitalism creates a new class of people, workers, proletarians. And um, not only, you know, is there the cr fundamental criticism of, of Marxism that like the workers are the ones who are producing the vast majority of value in society, they should be in, engaging in its um, proceeds, but also that this proletarian status is something that is very um, hard to knock out. And it's actually becoming a, almost, um, it's the majority, uh, it's, it's the majority status of people across the globe. Um, today, um, versus peasants or, you know, under feudal system, all of these different kinds of jobs or different ranks and statuses, Pro being a proletariat, being a working person, um, becomes something that, you know, grows and grows and grows in its, um, in, in, in its numbers. It creates this like true mass that is international, um, in, in a lot of ways, like universal and historical in the sense that there's working people before us and there'll be working people ahead of us. Um, you know, we, it, it creates this new class of, of people that, you know, the, the Marx line is like capitalism creates its own grave diggers. Right. Um, so these are the three fundamental principles of social science, according to Rosa. And her argument here is that, um, Bernstein rejects most importantly, the first one is that this anarchic system of production will lead to capitalist uh, collapse. Um, we can go down the, the text a little bit more. Um, he does not merely reject a certain form of the collapse. He rejects the very possibility of collapse. He says textual, textually, and this is quoting from him, one could claim that by the collapse of the present society is meant something else than a general commercial crisis, worse than all others. That is a complete uh, collapse of the capital system brought about as a result of its own contradictions. And to this, he replies, with the growing development of a society, uh, of society, a complete and almost general collapse of the present system of production becomes more and more improbable because capitalist development increases on the one hand, the capacity of adaptation, and on the other, that is at the same time, the dif differentiation of industry. And mm. this last bit here, the differentiation of industry will become very important um, later on. Um, you know, I mean, so is it just me or is that that's pretty much massively contradicted by the Great Depression or no? I mean, you could take that two ways, right? You could say the Great Depression. I, I, you know, to be fair, I think yeah, that yeah. like particularly this first chapter, I think at least for me, the way I read it is that like, I think it's worthwhile to really get what Rosa's saying. It's like uh, reading it in, in modern times, um, being a little sympathetic to Bernstein in the sense that like yeah. those conditions themselves didn't lead to the collapse and the overthrow of capitalism. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the idea that like we're moving towards post-crisis capitalism is laughable. Um, right. You know, as, yeah, as that's true. Cause I mean, I keep thinking of all like the new dealers post uh, 29 that were like, yeah, we finally like, you know, put to bed these, uh, you know, myths about the free market and we can finally like move past this. And I think like Rosa's work is as good as any is explaining why that didn't take, uh, mm. and wasn't permanently a victory basically. Um, but again, we'll get into to some of the technical things in, in just a bit. This is setting up the theoretical stakes. Um, when she responds um, to that by saying, the question arises, why and how in that case can we attain the final goal? According to scientific socialism, um, the historic necessity of the socialist revolution manifests itself above all in the growing anarchy of capitalism, which drives the system into an impasse. But if one admits with Bernstein that capitalist development does not move in the direction of its own ruin, then socialism seems to be objectively necessary. There remain, there remain the other two mainstays of the scientific explanation of socialism, which are also said to be the consequences of capitalism itself, the socialization of the process of production, and the growing consciousness of the proletariat. It is these two matters 
that Bernstein has in mind when he says the suppression of the theory of collapse does not in any way deprive the socialist doctrine of the power of persuasion. For examine closely what are all the factors enumerated by us that make for the suppression or the modification of the former crisis. Nothing else, in fact, than the conditions or even the party, the germs, the socialization of production and exchange. Um, you know, so, you know, effectively what he's saying is, you know, socialism still has a decent amount of explanatory power, but more importantly, rhetorical power. Um, but uh, um, the idea that capitalism um, creates these new systems to like ameliorate or lessen its own contradictions, like the credit system or the creation of industry cartels, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, it's very unclear. And I think um, if you look at history, that the things that he was seeing is sort of like capitalism has reached this new high phase where the crises are sort of being mm -hmm. escaped through um, legislative, legal, and uh, economic organization. Um, it, it turns out to be, I think, historically uh, false. All right. Um, so... Let's, um, I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing anything. So we're sort of setting up the stakes here. Um, it is interesting to hear her talk about like communication among these other things that Bernstein theorizes will move us beyond the crises of capitalism, like the telegraph, because they can, you know, um, communicate, uh, um, quickly across at distance, you're going to mm -hmm. lose this thing. But I mean, and then we now know like flash crashes and certain types of automated trading and literally mm -hmm. a company's trying to like dig new, um, uh, uh, um, phone uh, fiber lines so that's quicker between like Albany and uh, Manhattan, just so you get a split second faster uh, trade yeah. information. Like and like and doesn't we all feel like totally insulated from the crisis of capitalism, don't we? Um. So she basically makes the argument um, to paraphrase. You know, if certain reforms, if these certain new systems are in fact preventing the collapse. Um, how can they be something which is the the future system? Or are they not appendages of like the old order and what maintains it? So what I'm saying is like Bernstein looks at some of the reforms under capitalism, um, some of the new innovations under capitalism in their time and sees this is socialism. Like this is being built up in our world. These reforms under capitalism are are, are the, the opening for socialist society. And she says, these things are deeply attached to the system of private property, to the system of wage exploitation. How can you sit here and say with a straight face that this is something that is escaping or breaking us out of, of this kind of system? Um, you know, there if they are germs of or conditions of a socialist order, it is in theory, like in a theoretical sense and not in a historical sense. And let me say that again. So just like make it really clear. If you're seeing regulation of capitalism as the potential um, for the, of the socialist order, the new order, um, it's only true in a theoretical sense, in the sense of like, oh, this might be sort of against the inclinations or the reactions of a, a capital system, like a, a perfect capitalist system. Um, capitalism coming up against reality. So maybe in theory, in some sense, you can look at these things, but in a historical sense, in a sense of how do we come from early 20th century Germany, um, capitalist Germany to global revolution, could you see these reforms as truly being the historical stepping stones that bring socialism? And this is the crux of, of, of her argument, in my opinion, is that it's not that, you know, some of the reforms that, you know, particularly things that, you know, might aid workers are inherently bad, right? It's that you're mistaken if you're seeing these things as this is the stepping stone or the path that is bringing us to, to socialism. And, you know, if you look at, at Rosa, I think she's very vindicated um, in the historical sense. When you look at what has happened with a lot of these reforms that have been one that, like, I think socialists would fight for and argue for shorter working day, minimum wage, all these kind of things, right? We want working people to have better lives, obviously. Um, but if you look at what's happened historically in the United States, in, in Europe, what happens to all these reforms? Well, in the times of capitalist crisis, they get rolled back. 
Yeah. And right now in the United States, when we talk about the union movement here, we're talking about fighting for shit that we had in the 60s. You know what I mean? So it, it's incorrect in a historical sense to see these things as the germs of socialism. Um, yeah. You might say that like in a theoretical sense, socialists won't work and people will have more power and a better life. Um, but you can't see this as the roadmap as to how to achieve that. And this, I think, more than anything, clearly sort of states her frustration um, with, with Bernstein's arguments. Absolutely. Um, and before we move on to the next uh, chapter, um, you know, she makes some digs at him, as we have in the past, if you've watched our Marx um, theory reading videos about a difference between materialist and, and uh, idealist politics. Um, you know, Bernstein also sort of um, completely subsumes socialist theory into, um, you know, something that is uh, idealist in the sense of like, we're going to win people over to these ideas versus something that's materialist reacting to and participating in politics to actual changes in, in material conditions. So let's go to this next chapter which is called um, the um, adaptation of capital. And this is um, probably going to be um, um, you know, one of the more um, technical chapters, though I don't think that this isn't even the hardest one. Again, I don't think this is a very difficult text in general. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, this is the one that I think really gets to the kind of you know, political economy of the problem with Bernstein's theory, even in 20th century Germany, without having the advantage that we have now to see reformism didn't lead to revolution. Um, you know, we do get to sit there and understand this in the same sense that we know that that crisis itself uh, didn't lead to um, communism. So I don't know if you had um, audio text from this. I have a kind of breakdown of, of her arguments about what credit are under capitalism. Um, the, I mean, I got the, a bookmark actually at the very opening if we wanted. Yeah, uh, I want to play that. Oops. Okay, yeah. Let's see, where's my player? There it is. Chapter two, the adaptation of capital. According to Bernstein, the credit system the perfected means of communication, and the new capitalist combines are the important factors that forward the adaptation of capitalist economy. Credit has diverse applications in capitalism. Its two most important functions are to extend production and to facilitate exchange. When the inner tendency of capitalist production to extend boundlessly strikes against the restricted dimensions of private property, Credit appears as a means of surmounting these limits in a particular capitalist manner. Credit, through shareholding, combines in one magnitude of capital a large number of individual capitals. It makes available to each capitalist the use of other capitalists' money, in the form of industrial credit. As commercial credit, it accelerates the exchange of commodities, and therefore the return of capital into production and thus aids the entire cycle of the process of production. The manner in which these two principal functions of credit influence the formation of crises is quite obvious. If it is true that crises appear as a result of the contradiction existing between the capacity of extension, the tendency of production to increase, and the restricted consumption capacity of the market, credit is precisely, in view of what was stated above, the specific means that makes this contradiction break out as often as possible. To begin with, it increases disproportionately the capacity of the extension of production, and thus constitutes an inner motive force that is constantly pushing production to exceed the limits of the market. But credit strikes from two sides. After having, as a factor of the process of production, provoked overproduction, Credit, as a factor of exchange, destroys during the crisis the very productive forces it itself created. At the first symptom of the crisis, credit melts away. It abandons exchange where it would still be found indispensable, and appearing instead ineffective and useless, there where some exchange still continues, 
it reduces to a minimum the consumption capacity of the market. Bes Should we uh, keep rolling a little bit? Besides having these two principal results, credit also influences the formation of crises in the following ways. It constitutes the technical means of making available to an entrepreneur the capital of other owners. It stimulates, at the same time, the bold and unscrupulous utilization of the property of others. That is, it leads to speculation. Credit not only aggravates the crisis in its capacity as a dissembled means of exchange, it also helps to bring and extend the crisis by transforming all exchange into an extremely complex and artificial mechanism that, having a minimum of metallic money as a real base, is easily disarranged at the slightest occasion. We see that credit, instead of being an instrument for the suppression or the attenuation of crises, is on the contrary a particularly mighty instrument for the formation of crises. It cannot be anything else. Credit eliminates the remaining rigidity of capitalist relationships. It introduces everywhere the greatest elasticity possible. It renders all capitalist forces extensible, relative and mutually sensitive to the highest degree. Doing this, it facilitates and aggravates crises, which are nothing more or less than the periodic collisions of the contradictory forces of capitalist economy. I think that's good. Um, so I know. I mean, that's very straightforward. Like for anybody who knows about the way credit has worked in our society, like well, I mean, it's, it's I think, exacerbating it. I mean, th yeah. I mean, thinking about uh, what happened in like the financial crisis in our lifetime. I mean, the point is very well made by Rosa, and uh, you know, even before um, some of the more modern financial <laughs> products and you know the kind of central banking systems that we've developed and international banking systems that we've developed. I mean, very prescient here. And again, like this is why we had Baskar on the show this week, and you know, he was saying that like, could you imagine having to live life without being a Marxist and sort of like living in complete confusion on a lot of the like having to enter into all these different moments and, and crises like without having any kind of direction, um, you know, you'd really be at a disadvantage. But I know that was a longer piece of of text. I think it is very straightforward. But just to like recap a, li a little bit um, to help people understand, um, you know, what she's talking about, and also like what credit is. So the first thing that she says that credit does under capitalism is extend production. And maybe just for a second, I'll put on like my bourgeois economist cap just to explain credit in a kind of perfect world system. And maybe let's use farming um, to help people understand this. Um, we should have Kowalski on to <laughs> next time <laughs> to, to do this. But if you have a farm, um, what do you do? You grow things and uh, you grow things seasonally. So at the beginning, and you get paid at the end of the growing season. So what do you need at the start of that process? You need capital right? You need capital because you need to buy the equipment that's necessarily, that's necessary to, you know, fertilize the ground, to, to plant the crops, to maintain them during that period of time. You need the seeds. You also might need to some um, money up top to be able to pay the laborers um, for all the work that's being done before you realize the, the gains, before you realize the return. Um, and oftentimes a way to deal with that crisis um, instead of, um, you know, just having a bunch of money sitting in the bank, people take out loans, or you have things called futures where you sell um, a good in advance um, before it has even been, um, you know, created at a set price. Um, and you do that for a few reasons. One, so that you have the money at the beginning. Um, the you know, We have the promise at the beginning of the season that you're going to get realization on that. And two, that you can plan your growing system and your growing season accordingly and you're sort of insulated from shock. So like, you know, if at the end of the growing season, the price of wheat collapses, you don't end up investing a lot of money with an expectation of a certain return and not get that. So that's what futures are, but just credit in general, right? Just like giving a loan that sort of allows production to happen under a capital system if you don't have have the money. And, and like this is, you know, across any industry, 
anything. I think farming just, uh, you know, works well because you can understand like the system of, of the growing season. So credit extends production, right? That's why it developed under capitalism because you needed to be able to have a, um, a claim on future money, right? Is, is the way a lot of bourgeois um, economists see it. But I think Rose's point here is, is, is worthwhile bringing it up too. She talks about systematically credit is the socialization of all of the capitalist money. All of the capitalist money goes into the financial system, which creates this kind of, of, of cycle where all capitalists, in a sense, depending on their relationships with banks and things like that, have access to each other's money. Um, and it becomes mm-hmm. a very critical engine of, of, of capitalism. It's also um, one of the other aspects of credit under capitalism, as Rosa was just lining out, is something that's used to facilitate exchange, where you might not have the cash on hand at a certain time to be able to buy a certain good, um, but other people need to sell their shit in order to make sure that capitalism works. So credit can be very helpful in making sure that the capitalist economy is functioning in the sense that there's always buyers and sellers. And credit can sort of step in in moments where um, you know the, the seller side is a little bit weaker. Um, for whatever kind of reason. And, you know, this can, you know, um, can be helpful, um, obviously, for people who who need credit, but it also really exposes the entire capitalist economy. And again, um, I want to sort of just lay this out just plainly for folks, but let's not forget the reason we're talking about credit right now is because Bernstein's seeing these things and saying capitalism is breaking out of itself, right? Um, It's, it's, it's weakening the, the, the collapse potential under, under its own system. But in fact, capitalism and and credit and the financial system extend crisis. How? Think about the financial crisis um, in in, in this country. What was that functionally? It was a debt crisis. It was people holding bad debt that they couldn't pay because wages in this country have been um, declining for years. So the ability of people to be able to buy property, be able to buy a house was limited. So how do you make sure that the real estate market still becomes very profitable is a very important part of the American economy. We well, need to be able to create a system that allows there to be more buyers than, than there are people who have money in the bank. The problem is, is that once they started packaging together bad loans with good loans, once there was a run on some of that debt, it included all of the financial system. So a particular crisis became a national and an international one. So mm-hmm. instead of actually being, you know, one quick trick to like get out of like the crisis of the business cycle under capitalism, it becomes something that exposes the entirety of the economic system to any kind of, of, of potential crisis. Yeah. And, and worryingly enough, um, we are living through um, another massive increase in, in, in debt just last year, credit card balances jumped 15% for American working people, um, which is one of the highest leaps that we've had in 20 years. Um, so again, you know, these, we, we haven't escaped these, these crises, um, debt has just sort of reappeared. And I think another thing that's really important, um, to note with the facilitation of exchange is like, there's the kind of crisis, like how much actual money is their economy versus how much money, um, is there in debt and debt is debt and credit and all these things, they sort of become double counted. So it increases like the amount of like mm. money in, in, in the economy in the sense of like, you have a claim to the debt as the debt holder, somebody else is utilizing that money. So it almost doubles um, the the amount of money in the sense of like what's sort of being circulated through the American economy. And it gets even more complicated when you think about people who hold debt don't even sit on it. In American capitalism, you sell debt. If you have debt, right. I want to get, you know, I, I loan some guy $20,000. I'm a bank. I loan some guy $20,000 for a truck. I don't want to wait five years to get it. I sell it for $18,000 to a bank to get $18,000 in my thing now. So it's not just like double counted. It expands dramatically, right? And that's why like, what's the real amount of like dollar value in the American economy is something that, um, you know, is, is very much um, attached, uh, you know, to the system of, of, of credit and, and finance. And, um, you know, so it can fill in crises, right? If there aren't, isn't enough consumer demand, you can, you know, the extension of, of credit card debt or just bank debt or whatever kind of debt um, becomes a nice kind of way to plug that hole. But um, one thing, especially I mean, 
sorry just to cut you off, but we literally did that with student loans. We talked about this in the 60s. We didn't want it to um, uh, uh, look bad coming off of this uh, government book. So we decided to magic uh, some money in finance and say, banks, you, you're entitled to this. Yes. Yeah, no. Um, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the, the debt... Um, it, it fills in, in, in these kinds of holes temporarily. It, it can expose the entire economy to a crisis. So like you can have a particular crisis in one industry or in one market that quickly becomes a full scale, full blown national international crisis. And you know what the biggest problem is typically is that once the economy is not doing well, people and banks and financial institutions are much less interested in extending credit. So the system that is sort of met meant to sort of patch up these holes, these bumps in the road when whenever there's a crisis, um, it becomes very, very, very weak. Um, and it, as she said, shriveled up or disappears, or whatever the phrase was, um, in terms of crisis. And just zooming out for a second, this is why central banking becomes so important um, in capitalism later, because the bank, the central banks operate from a different kind of perspective that they fill in these holes, um, regardless of, uh, of, um, you know, what the actual market conditions are, right? That, because before when there was a crisis, all the, the banks would just collapse. The banks would just have no money and you'd lose your life savings. So now we have things like insurance, um, you know, federal insurance on, on bank deposits. Um, and you have the central bank, which loans money's, m- money to banks so that they always have enough, you know, cash on hand to be able to operate um, normally. So the central bank is like a more advanced system of financialization and, 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 and pr- the production of credit un- under the capital system society, but it's still engaged um, and threatened by the same kind of crises, right? Because um, they can only try to push the economy so far um, in trying to fill in in, in, in these holes um, th- in their willingness to sort of um, participate in, in risky operations has not been able to sort of it, it, it's prevented the full bo- full blown kind of financial class where like the, all the banks shut to their doors, um, but it's not really been very successful at getting us out of a financial crisis. And then they end up holding on to and distorting the market because they're holding on to bad debt um, um, and, and things like that. Um, but that's just debt on the most um, large scale. Um the other thing that that she notes here, again, doing more political economy, is it extends um, production, right? And we talked about that in the sense of um, of uh, you know why you need debt and and credit to be able for, for production, um, but commercial credit accelerates uh, commodity exchange, right? In good times, right? People are buying more things because there's more money flowing in the system. Um, And that money returns back into production. But because the kind of market signals are distorted, um, because there's more credit money out there, um, a lot of that that, that kind of like market indication or the the ideas of of a capitalist, I can sell this many t-shirts and make this much money off of it. Um, It creates this system where it inevitably leads to overproduction. which is one of the fundamental crises of, of, of capitalism, um, where the you know the ability to make as much money off of your investment, um, you know, starts to decline, and that always puts a lot of pressure on the the financial system and the credit system. So it has this double role where it like, um, you know, it sort of it creates capacity for crisis, um, in the sense of. Uh, um, when, uh, when things are bad, it disappears and then things get way worse. It accelerates them. And it also encourages overproduction because a lot of the kind of buyers out there um, are utilizing credit um, to be able to do these kinds of things. So it encourages overproduction um, um, that only gets worse again when a kind of financial crisis or, or capital crisis hits. And I have some more from the text here. Um Um, one second, excuse me. 
In short, credit uh, reproduces all the fundamental antagonism of, of the capitalist world. Mm. The crisis of overproduction, the crisis of the business cycle, um, which are just fundamental to capitalism even before more advanced financial system. Credit doesn't get you out of it. It actually um, just recreates it again. It just moves it around a bit. It accentuates them. It precipitates their development and thus pushes the capitalist world forward to its own destruction. The prime act of a capitalist a adaptation, as far as credit is concerned, should really consist in breaking and suppressing of credit. In fact, credit is far from being a means of capitalist adaptation, it is on the contrary a means of destruction of the most extreme revolutionary significance. Has not this revolutionary character of credit actually inspired plans of socialist reform? Um, hmm. And then we get into um, the next bit, which is employers, organizations, unless you had anything else that you wanted to say about credit. Yeah, no, let's get to the employers, organizations. So the employers- it's funny to me that this was greeted as- a harbinger of progress. <laughs> so the employers' organizations is probably one of the, the I think, historically funnier ones um, that you can get from Bernstein. Um, so here we're talking about loose coordin coordination of, of capitalist um, industry, of cartels, of monopolies. Um, so Rosa writes, just as fragile as the second means of capitalist adaptation, employers' are so organizations. According to Bernstein, such organizations will put an end to the anarchy of production and do away with crises through their regulation of production. The multiple repercussions of the development of cartels and trusts have not been considered too carefully up to now, but they predict a problem that can only be solved um, with the aid of Marxist theory. One thing is certain. We could speak of damming up capitalist anarchy um, through the agency of capitalist combines only in the measures that cartels, trusts, etc., become even approximately the dominant form of production. But such a possibility is excluded by the very nature of cartels. The final economic aim and result of combines is the following. Through the suppression of competition in a given branch of production, the distribution of the massive profit realized on the market is influenced in such a manner that there is an increase of the share going to this branch of industry. Such organization of the field can increase the rate of profit in one branch, branch of industry at the expense of another. That is precisely why it cannot be generalized for when it is extended to all important branches of industry, this tendency suppresses its own influence. A great example of this, railroads in the United States of America. You had railroad cartels that basically fucked over every business in this country. Um, they were charging extremely high rates for freight um, and were harming all other industry in the American economy because the cartels are not interested um, in <laughs> the betterment or the efficiency of, of capital society. They are interested in realizing as much profit as possible from their kind of privileged position of being, you know, monopolies or the most powerful, um, you know, realization of, the, of that industry in a particular market. Um, so the idea that like cartels and that kind of thing was breaking out of anarchic um, capitalist organization is just absolutely ludicrous um, because it's playing the same kind of role where capitalists um, wage war upon each other, you know, um, and, and 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 create crises and 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 a lot of uh, fundamental, um, uh, you know, fundamental uh, you know problems with the with the capitalist economy. In a general way, going back to the text, in a general way, cartels, just like credit, appear therefore as a determined phase of capitalist development, which is in the last analysis, aggravates the anarchy of capital of the capitalist world and expresses and ripens its internal contradictions. Cartels aggravate the antagonism existing between the mode of production and exchange by sharpening the struggle between the producer and consumer, as is the case, especially in the United States. They aggra aggravate furthermore the antagonism existing between the mode of production and the mode of appropriation by opposing in most brutal fashion to the working class the superior force of organized capital and thus increasing the antagonism between capital and labor. Finally, combinations aggravate the co contradiction existing between the international character of the capitalist world economy and the national character of the state, insofar as they are always accompanied by a general terror for which sharpens the uh, differences between among capital states. We must add to the decidedly revolutionary influence exercised by cartels on the concentration of production, technical progress, etc. In other words, when evaluated from the angle of their final effect on the capitalist economy, cartels and trusts fail 
as a means of adaptation. They fail to attenuate the contradictions of capitalism. On the contra- contrary, they appear to be an instrument of greater anarchy. They encourage the further development of the internal contradictions of capitalism. They accelerate the coming of, uh, of a general decline in capitalism. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I do like that she keeps using the anarchy of capitalists because like in our sort of Koch brother, like this is that sort of, recognizing that is i guess what led me more to marxism right sure. like as like where does this come from why is this dominating society and uh and it turns out that actually like it's it's not the the Koch brothers and all these different like uh pharmaceutical companies or whatever they're not getting together to like help us yes i i know i've been reading a lot um from the text y'all but this I mean, she just does it so well. Um, this, I think, is such a great... Th- so before we read this text, remember, one of Bernstein's main arguments um, is not only that the adaptations and the reforms under capitalism, the new innovations under capitalism um, are sort of creating the conditions for socialism. Um, instead of collapse, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll just see sort of new innovations under capitalist economy that will sort of just lead us to a tipping point where... The, the value share actually just flips to the general public and to workers over um, the capitalist class. And effectively, the administrators just will be almost like, you know, you will just wake up one day and it'll just sort of be on the other side. The other thing that's really critical, I think, to note is that they're, you know, crucial to this argument is the idea that it is advanced capitalism that is doing this. Advanced capitalism is escaping from the pre the early forms of capitalism, which are prone to crisis, which are maybe prone to collapse, but it is these innovations in the system that are breaking it. And then I think this is like the, you know, one, two, boom, knockout punch um, in this piece to, to uh, at least on the level of cartels and credit here, um, mm-hmm. or the social progressive nature of, of capitalism leading us to socialism. But if the credit system, cartels, and the rest do not suppress the anarchy of capitalism, why have we not had a major commercial crisis for two decades since 1873? Is this not a sign that contrary to Marx's analysis, the capitalist mode of production has adapted itself, at least in a general way, to the needs of society? Hardly had Bernstein rejected in 1898 Marx's theory of crisis when a profound general crisis broke out in 1900. Well, seven years later, a new crisis beginning in the United States hit the world market. Facts proved the theory of adaptation to be false. They showed at the same time that the people who abandoned Marxist theory of crisis only because no crisis occurred within a certain space of time merely confused the essence of this theory with one of its secondary exterior aspects, the 10-year cycle. The description of the cycle of modern capitalist industry as a 10-year period was to Marxian angles in 1860 and 1870 only a simple um, statement of facts. It was not based on a natural law, but on a a series of given historical circumstances that were connected with the rapidly spreading activity of young capitalism. Crises may repeat, I'm skipping down a little bit. Crises may um, repeat themselves every five or 10 years or even every eight or 20 years. But what proves best the falseness of Bernstein's theory is that it is in the countries having the greatest development of the famous means of adaptation, credit, perfected communications and trust that the last crisis of 1907, 1908 was most violent. The belief that capitalist production could adapt itself to exchange presupposes one of two things. Either the world market can spread unlimitedly or, on the contrary, the development of the productive forces is so fettered that it cannot pass beyond the bounds of the market. The first hypothesis constitutes a material impossibility. The second is rendered just as impossible by the constant technical progress that creates new productive forces in all branches. Put it bluntly, the point she's making here is that if these capitalist economies are adapting and entering into this new form that is putting away these contradictions, why is it worse in America? Why is it worse in the countries that have the most advanced capitalist economies when these crises hit? Why are they the ones that are the most affected? In fact, it's because of the very adaptations that Bernstein is arguing are breaking us out of it. It's because of the cartels, it's because of the credit system, Mm -hmm. that the fundamental contradiction of capitalism that leads to crisis, the contradiction of overproduction, the contradiction of the business cycle, creates this, um, you know, is, is something that you can set your watch to. And 
when it hits these countries with highly complicated systems of financialization, of cartel coordination, it hits them way worse than other economies. So far from being an escape um, from the anarchic system of capitalism, it in fact is something that makes it far, 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 far worse. And like, it, it really shows like the, the, um, the, <laughs> the intelligence of Rosa to be able to see this argument, as I was saying earlier, you read Bernstein, you're like, you know, maybe there is something to this. This does seem to fill some holes. She says, look at what is actually happening. Look what's happening historically. Look what's happening right now. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. And I mean, from the, um, with the, uh, luxury of time, I mean, I think it's pretty clear, like, especially those, the idea that uh, credit or cartels would be a stabilizing force rather than accelerating what I think, like, I mean, at least my experience, uh, born in 1988, uh, yeah. proves that to be accurate. So there's one last section in the text that we're covering today. Um, not even a section, there's like one last point that she makes is Bernstein is also, um, unsurprisingly, as many folks who sort of share these ideas is, uh, somebody who believes that, um, there's a lot of potential in the small and middle sized businesses, uh, to fundamentally change industry. Um, and, uh, unless you had anything specific that you want to pull through that, um, I think you can summarize it very simple, simply here that like you can consider small businesses like pioneers or colonists as small capitalists rise. They eventually produce so much. They are overtaken with large scale industry. Um, and then new markets are created. Small capitalists become replaced by large capitalists. Um, and this is kind of cycle. It's like, so the kind of crucial industry starts out as small production, becomes medium sized production, becomes large production. Those are the companies you think about as the most powerful. New needs are created, middle companies rise up, and then they get mowed over um, by industry. And when large industry gets collapsed, other things sort of grow up and, and take that space. Look at the history of American capitalism. Think about you know certain kind of companies that were very hot to buy in the 80s and 90s. See how many of those are around today. You can see a lot of companies who came in and filled in the hole, the production, doing the services that were done, maybe with different technology or whatever, um, in, in that role. Might have started out as a small, medium-sized business, become the big one, collapse. Anyways, like the point is that the the production of like small, new radical small business owners. It's just grass. You know what I mean? It grows, you mow it over in two weeks, grows, you know, like that's the, the fundamental system of, 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 of capital. So any hope there is, 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 is ludicrous at best. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. So, um, that's it for part one. We're going to do this as a three part, um, series. The next, um, the next section that we're going to cover um, is going to be on the state. It's going to be on trade unions, uh, which I find to that chapter to be very interesting, um, but one that probably is worth spending, dedicating a, a decent amount of time to um, talking about some of the more like social reforms and work reforms under capitalism. So this first section is setting up the argument and looking at um, these kind of grand nationwide or international wide systems that are supposed to be these adaptations of capitalism that are making the, you know, um, making in Bernstein's mind clear that, you know, capitalism is bringing us to socialism anyway. We don't need to wait for collapse. Um, do you have any like kind of final thoughts, um, on, on that section or anything you want to say before, um, you know, before we come back in a week? Uh, no, nothing beyond sort of what I've hinted at already, which is that it's, it's interesting to see, um, like this sort of debate, this, the sort of how familiar it is. Um, uh, and, uh, like with it's sort of this fight we have with, um, a sort of, I think a progressivism that believes in just like, uh, the long arc just it just bends automatically you know mm -hmm. um sort of problem and uh that is an illusion um as far as i i can tell and i think you know, this is a really good way of elaborating that or rosa's like done as well as anybody i've seen in elaborating that and again you know um oftentimes when you read these there's not really um any kind of sense like the the last chapter is like two lines about we need to have the working class come together and we win. I promise you that's not how um, Rose ends this book. So, 
again, understanding that this is one of three. So this is setting up the the, the scale wide problems. Next is on this particular thing of, of of unions, some of the benefits and negative things that have happened um, through that that struggle. Understanding capitalism's relationship with the state, and then we start to get to what Rose's um, you know theory of, of of revolutionary politics is. If like if anything, I would just say like if. Um, what Bernstein called adaptations of capital, we might think of them more as hist- a historical process of trying different arrangements to dance around the fundamental crises of capitalism. I mean, I don't even think we have to say like maybe that's what it was. Capitalism is a system prone to crisis. These were attempts by a capitalist, um, the capitalist class, to try to get out of that crisis. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you can't get out of it. It's fundamental. It's fundamental at the level of production. That's the Marxist point. If anything, um, if you know, if you want to say that Rosa and maybe a Lenin are too rosy-eyed about the theory of collapse, it's not that their criticisms um, were wrong, but rather how long this development of so-called adaptations may be a kind of prolonged crisis of of capitalism in the absence of revolution, and that might be one of the darker realizations: is that we haven't escaped um, that those contradictions at all. Um, but just because we haven't escaped those fundamental contradictions hasn't on its own brought about the the, the final death knell of this system. Um, and I think both Rosa and, and Lenin, I was just you know being fair and, and trying to create a criticism. I think both Rosa and Lenin understood that there's crisis and in crisis there's opportunity, um, but without the active agent of, of history, working class politics, proletarian class, um, you won't get it. And one of the darker things to realize is that this is a fundamental reality of capitalism that it's going to try these quote unquote adaptations to its fundamental contradictions. And what we're seeing today is not some new capitalism necessarily. It's different, obviously, in some senses, um, but it's just attempts to move the crisis. Like it's hot potato. You know what I mean? It's just like trying to move the problem of capitalism into different directions, but it always comes back and it hits really, really hard. Um, but I, I think Rosa is, is, is is great. I think this text is actually extremely clear. I highly suggest people read it, and I hope this was helpful. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for guiding us through it, David. Yeah, of course, man. I always love doing this with you, brother. We'll see you all uh, next week, friends. See you, folks. <laughs>